Hello and welcome to episode 148 of the How to Survive podcast. This week, a clucking good movie. Uh, what do you call it? A cluck? That noise? That one? No. Chris, the cluck expert, <laughs> here to join me. Hello. How, how are you? Uh, I'm very well. I'm, I haven't slept. Uh, <laughs> I'm shaken. Yeah. So we saw Hereditary last night. Yeah. When this episode goes to air, it will have been in the theatres for five days. Mm-hmm. So if you haven't seen it, then do stop listening now because it's a movie that bears seeing without spoilers. I think. Yeah. And I'm sure you've seen the trailers and the mm-hmm. posters because they're everywhere and mm-hmm. it really is worth... And the, I, I'm impressed by the marketing campaign in a way because it is willfully misleading you you don't know what you're going in for uh, yeah yes and no yeah you, you're going to be scared that's yeah. it. that's yeah. to be sure yeah. it's it's definitely worth seeing go see it um and then come back and listen to your favorite horror podcast yes how to survive and if you haven't listened before what we like to do is talk about the film in depth look at it from all angles and establish exactly what we need to know about the movie uh, before we then go on to talk about how to survive in it, mm-hmm. there will be spoilers, as mentioned. Uh, so, your final warning duck out now or forever hold your. Open the can of worms, haven't you? <laughs> why? <laughs> Can't stop doing it. No, it's, it's quite addictive. Yeah. I can see why she likes yeah, it so much. Exactly. <laughs> Peter, there's your suit. It's heartening to see so many strange new faces here today. I know my mom would be very touched and probably a little suspicious. My mother was a very secretive and private woman. It's Grandma. You know you were her favorite, right? Even when you were a little baby, she wouldn't let me feed you because she needed to feed you. She was a very difficult woman, which maybe explains me. I recognize you from your mother. What? Sometimes I swear I can feel them in the room. Oh my God! What's that? She isn't gone. So, quick plot recap before we throw on. Hereditary tells the story of the Graham family. It begins following the death of Ellen, the family matriarch. At Ellen's funeral, in the eulogy delivered by her daughter Annie, we learn that she was a secretive individual whose mind degraded in her final years. Annie lives with her husband Steve and their teenage son Peter and their 13-year-old daughter Charlie. Annie appears to be having trouble processing the loss of her mother, and is even hallucinating seeing her around the house. She attends a bereavement support group where she shares troubling stories about her mother's past. We learn that Annie's relationship with her mother was fraught, with lengthy periods without contact. We also learn that her brother died by suicide, ostensibly due to paranoid delusions, including claims that his mother was trying to put other people inside him. All completely normal, and I'm sure, take it at face value. Yeah, don't, uh, don't, don't worry, worry about yeah. any of that coming back up later. At home, Steve receives a call from the cemetery to tell him that Ellen's grave has been desecrated. He elects to keep this from his wife. Hmm. Because she's obviously... She's under a lot of stress. Yes, understandably. And she came home with soil all over her hands. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't really. No, she didn't. Charlie, who appears to be distant with her family at the best of times, is now spending time sleeping in her treehouse, walking around the grounds of their home at all hours, and generally saying creepy and sinister things to her mother. At school, a pigeon flies into the window and dies, and at break time, Charlie removes the pigeon's head with a pair of scissors to use in a sinister art project at home. Hmm. At his mother's insistence, Peter takes Charlie to a high school party in order to force her to fit in among other children. Peter goes upstairs at the party to smoke weed and tells Charlie to try some of that delicious chocolate cake. Hmm. Unfortunately... The cake is filled with nuts, to which Charlie is badly allergic. Yeah. She goes into anaphylactic shock, and Peter grabs her and jumps in the car. Going 100 miles per hour, they race to the hospital. Struggling to breathe, Charlie lowers her window and sticks her head out. 
just as Peter swerves to avoid hitting a dog. Charlie's head smashes into a telegraph pole. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even help yourself. <laughs> Peter breaks and spends some minutes frozen in position, unable to turn around and face what's happened. He drives home and goes to bed. In the morning, he hears his mother screaming as she finds Charlie's body without its head. Hmm. Peter is struggling to process what happened and begins hallucinating Charlie's presence around the house. Annie attempts to return to her bereavement group, but is unable to go inside. In the car park, she's approached by Joan, a lady from the previous session, who confesses to Annie that she lost a son and grandson a few months ago and encourages Annie to contact her if she wants to talk. Annie takes up her offer and visits Joan's apartment. There, Annie recounts a memory of sleepwalking in previous years, waking up to find that she had soaked both of her sleeping children and herself in paint thinner before lighting a match. She woke Peter in the mayhem, and she fears that the event, which she claims was a sleepwalking misadventure, hmm. has brought an unfixable rift between them. Uh, that, and um, presumably him accidentally killing her daughter. You would imagine that that's part of it? Yes. At dinner, Peter goads his mother into a confrontation, asking her to open up with him so that they can overcome their issues. Annie loses her composure and screams at Peter, claiming that she knows it was an accident, but that she can never forgive him because he never took responsibility. Annie goes to the art supply store. She's a professional model builder, by the way. Mm. She makes miniatures. Mm. And in the car park, she meets Joan. Joan tells her that all is right in the world because she attended a seance and can now commune with her lost grandson. Annie is sceptical, but agrees to a demonstration, which convinces her that the seance works. Mm. That night, Annie wakes to find her room covered in ants. She follows a trail of ants to her son's room where she finds him dead, with ants crawling out of every gap in his head. <laughs> she hears Peter calling to her and wakes up to discover that she was sleepwalking. Peter asks why she doesn't like him, and she tells him that she never wanted him and that she never wanted him and that she tried to have a miscarriage. Suddenly, both of them are covered with paint thinner, and Annie wakes up. It was all a dream. She decides to recite a spell that Joan gave her, which will allow Charlie to return from wherever her spirit currently is. She wakes Peter and Steve and coerces them into joining her seance. They stiffly agree, but call an end to proceedings when the candle shoots a pillar of flames in the air and Annie begins speaking with Charlie's voice. The next day at school, Peter hallucinates a version of himself smiling in reflected glass, despite the fact that he's frowning. Freaked out, he calls his father, who calls Annie to admonish her for her interest in the occult. Annie fears Charlie's spirit may have become malevolent and attempts to burn Charlie's notebook, an item she'd used to conjure Charlie's spirit earlier in the film. She throws the book in the fireplace, but her own arm catches fire, forcing her to extinguish the book. I guess she fears some sort of voodoo link between them. Yes. Annie goes to Joan's apartment for advice, but Joan is not there. Unbeknownst to Annie, the apartment has now turned into some kind of a shrine with a form of pentagram scratched into the dining room table containing a photo of Peter. Hmm. At school, Peter is eating outside and sees Joan calling to him from across a busy road. You say calling, she's like shouting. Yeah. But Only it's he, like yeah. in his head, like the voice is like it's in his head yeah. and no one else can hear her. And it's, that's pretty um, intense. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's very unsettling. Mm. She says things like, get out, Peter, and then starts saying like some incantations. Mm. And he's sat there, like clearly like losing his mind yeah. already. Yeah, because he's in like profound grief and yeah. sort of uh, guilt over his sister's death yes. anyway. And you've seen the fact that he's like struggling to sleep and barely functioning. Yeah. And then and stuff like this happens. <laughs> a stranger appears to be able to shout into his mind <laughs> from across a busy That's road. That's fine. Yeah. We've, we've all been there. Back in class, Peter is overcome with some kind of dyspepsia, uh, which turns his limbs rigid, his skin purple, and his face deformed. He snaps out of the seizure by smashing his own face into the desk, breaking his nose. Yeah, that would do it. <laughs> <laughs> Annie roots through her mother's belongings, uncovering various spell books which indicate that the mother was trying to summon someone called King Pyman. Uh, I know his brother, Simon. It's actually Payman. Uh, okay. Sorry. Payman, like payment, rather than Simon, Simon, Payman, Pyman. 
The I'm not doing on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> the spell book suggests that uh, King Pyman Payman needs a male host. Um, that's what Peter is. We conclude. Yeah. This goes some way to explaining why her mother had tried to raise Charlie as a boy, as well as a variety of other plot incidentals. Yes. Annie goes into the attic, and there she finds her mother's headless body. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Steve returns home with an unconscious Peter mm-hmm. and Annie begins to explain that her mother was part of some kind of cult who will wear the same symbol which she herself also wears in the form of a necklace given to her by her mother and that Joan was actually in cahoots with the mother and that they intend to do something terrible to Peter. Is that about right? Mm-hmm. She tells him about the body in the attic which he finds and accuses her of putting there. She then begs him, she then begs him to burn the cursed notebook which will also burn her, but will lift the curse. Steve refuses, claiming that it would be unhealthy to fuel her mania. So she grabs the book and throws it in the fire, which, of course, causes Steve to instantly immolate and die. Mm. A light washes over Annie, and she appears to be possessed. Peter wakes up and calls to his mother, (laughs) who we catch... Meanwhile. (laughs) Meanwhile. Yeah. Elsewhere in the house. Yeah. (laughs) Peter wakes up and calls to his mother who we catch crawling out of frame on the ceiling. Yep. That's fine. That is fine. (laughs) He he heads downstairs and finds his father's body. In one corner of the room, his mother floats on the ceiling. In another corner, a naked man stands in the cupboard. Yep. Peter runs up... Well, it's a doorway. It's not like a a wardrobe. Peter Peter runs upstairs and barricades himself in the attic. His mother tries to beat her way into the attic... Using her head as a battering ram. Yeah. On the ceiling. Yeah. Like, but when I say battering ram, like pneumatic drill. Yeah. More like it. And she's lying <laughs> on like, the roof. Oh, yeah, on the upside ceiling. Down. Upside down. In a sort of prayer position. But don't worry about it. <laughs> Eventually, the room is filled with naked people, and Peter looks up to find his mother soaring through her own neck with piano wire. Mm. Floating. Yeah. That's okay. When you say look up. Yeah. I mean, you mean look Versical. 10 feet above him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He throws himself through the window to yeah, his death. As you would. Yeah. Uh, a light traces his back and he reawakes, making a clicking noise, hmm. indicating that uh, Charlie, who favoured that noise, has entered his body. Hmm. Following his mother's now headless body, which floats up to the treehouse, <laughs> Peter. Again, fine. Yeah. Peter slash Charlie depending on your perspective, yeah. enters the treehouse to find a coven of naked people, as well as their headless mother and grandmother, kneeling in prayer to an effigy wearing a crown. From off screen, Joan explains that Charlie is now in Peter's body because she is the spirit of King Payman, one of the kings of hell. The movie ends as the crowd chants, All hail Payman," And that is hereditary. Comedy of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, What's your favourite bit? Is it the uh, the the sight of his mother decapitating herself with a piano wire? Is uh, it the child being decapitated with a? It's, it's this. Crush? I think it's the sight of Char- Charlie's head. Yeah. Uh, like swollen and uh, burned in purple, the sun. Yeah, yeah, and covered in ants on the road uh, where she'd been decapitated. I think it's that. Yeah, her, her decapitated head. Um, so we saw it last night, as I mentioned earlier. Mm. Were you? Because I, I have I have a healthy walk home from the train station after, mm. um, and it was dark, and I was pretty spooked. I think. Yeah, yeah, like looking in shadows and seeing things. That mm. sort of level of spooked. Okay. Were you similarly affected? I I wasn't, um, uh, but I, I don't I don't um, blame you for being. <laughs> feeling that way because it is a very intense and uh scary movie so it's good yeah i think it's very good um it's exactly the sort of horror movie that we love i would say yeah um in that it's light on jump scares and heavy on themes Mm. atmosphere dread tension i i don't think there's any jump scares in it no no. like even there's there's like uh, sort of sudden clicking, tongue clicking noises yeah, that come in, from in the dark. Yeah. yeah, 
uh, which is which is pretty creepy. And there's a few times when uh, there, again. <laughs> there's a few times, for example, I think towards the end when Peter sees the naked man, he turns around and his mother lunges out of like a dark corner. Yeah. But it's not, it doesn't have the cinematic language of a jump scare. No, exactly. It's just a startling event. It's, it's more upsetting than like jump scary. Yeah. And I think that's, it, it's, unfortunately, I mean, ups, upsetting is a more appropriate sort of adjective for how I found the film than like horrifying. Yeah. But unfortunately, an upset movie isn't <laughs> like, isn't a genre. Yeah. As we look um, back on the, the other upset movies that have come before it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it comes at night. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's very good. Tony Collette and Alex Wolf are both fantastic, I thought. Um, I mean, everyone in the film is pretty, like, doing exactly what they need to do. Yeah, but th- those two actors in particular, mm. because they have the most to do yeah. by quite a long stretch. The scenes in which Annie uh, is, is in sort of acute grief. They're genuinely, like, heartbreaking. Yeah. Like, you just... I, I thought I might have to just like, go for a minute. It was yeah, like, it was, it's yeah. very affecting yeah. and very powerful and extremely well played. Yes. And I liked the... You know, Peter goes from a sort of relatively confident teenager, a bit yeah. shy maybe, yeah, socially awkward, like most teenagers who want to, you know, meet yeah. girls. He starts out looking at the girl in front of him's like bum, yeah, and like smoking weed, mm. and by the end he's just like a wreck, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, like and that that act, that arc to his character is is very well played, mm. I thought. Um, because he turns into a sort of hysterical victim, which yeah. which is fair given what happens to him, <laughs> and uh, Alex Wolf sells it very well. But the the scenes following the car accident, I think, are sort of profoundly distressing. What do you well. mean in the immediate after? Yeah, where so it, like just screaming mother. Well, but bef- even before that, so oh, when, so, yeah, when he yeah, the, yeah. the 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 accident happens mm. and the camera just stays on uh, Peter's face. Yes. And there's even a shot which I really liked, which is from his perspective, where he looks up towards the rear view mirror. Yeah. And then it, the camera like snaps back down again because he, he cannot bear to yeah. look behind him. And then he drives off in this sort of state of shock and just goes to bed. And it's, it's horrible. It's profoundly yeah. horrible. I think that, I mean, that, that kind of scene mm. is why this film is scarier than a lot of other horror movies we've covered, right? Mm-hmm. As I said, there's no jump scares at all. And even when you compare it with something like It Follows, which is a paragon of tension in movies, mm-hmm. that has a lot of jump scares. Yeah. This has none, right? That's, that's a much more traditional horror movie. Yeah, well. it is. It's, it, this felt like slow cinema at times. Like, mm. you've got several scenes where 90% of the frame is completely still. Like, it might, it might be drawing in very gently to, like, a central subject, but... Mm-hmm. Like a lot of it is like just close-ups of people's faces while yeah. they're doing something. Like in the, the, you mentioned the scene after the car crash. That is basically just the photo with his eyes slowly welling. Yeah, and him like, but you, you like every fiber of my body was just like, like, like I'd been electrocuted after mm. that. Like I was just like so tense. And his his hands like release on the steering wheel and his feet release from the brake. But like minutes after it happens, and you realize mm. that you're still gripping like your hands yeah it's amazing like you to put you in the film in that way hmm. i think is like fantastic yeah i i agree i mean it's, it is very different and um i would say better than most of the the horror movies that we cover for sure i think a lot of that has to do with the sort of imagery mm. that it uses as well it's very nightmarish yes in the sense that um things that are jarring and don't make a lot of sense are not dwelt upon no. and they're not um they're not addressed within the film if you see what i mean they're just sort of presented to you mm. in the in a sort of dream logic manner for you to go well you're just going to have to accept this yeah. and because the film's moving on already yeah. <laughs> well when we did um it comes at night mm-hmm. there's a lot of scenes in that film where you kind of have to work out for yourself whether it's a dream or not. Mm-hmm. This has that to an extent because 
the the haunting is real by the end. You you establish that let's, let's call it the haunting, but like the paranormal events are happening, which leads you to believe, you know, the, are they hallucinations yeah. as the result of like traumatized dreams, or are they genuinely ha- these things genuinely happening? Mm. Right? Are there generally ants coming out of his head, which just disappear? Mm. I mean, that's more heavily a dream. But there's there's various scenes where you're like, well, what's a dream and what's not? Well, it's you know, it's Annie smashing her head against the ceiling. It's mm. Annie's body floating up into the treehouse, yeah. like things things of that nature, which feel dreamlike. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, Charlie seeing an apparition of her grandmother next to a burning fire in the in the field next to their house uh it's all those things which the way in which they're not addressed is um deeply unsettling and it's in um another film that we we talk about a lot uh which is kill list Mm. the main one in kill list is the sight of a woman waving yes from that is seen by a character out of a hotel window and Really, they sh- you know that because it's so unusual for this character to be in that, to be in that situation um, for various story reasons. He should tell people. He should be talking <laughs> about it. But the fact that he doesn't, yeah, and the fact that it's never addressed within the film makes it deeply unsettling. Yeah, and then obviously the, like, the rest it, yeah, of the film plays yeah. out. And there's a lot of those sorts of things there's, in this film. Even like you know, not calling the emergency services after you're in an accident. Mm. They're just going home. Like that's yeah. it seems illogical, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, that that There's, you get, that's you get almost the point, right? it's like how you don't know how you react in a trauma. Yeah. Well, that exactly. Yeah. That that is sort of a believable response to a traumatic event, isn't it? Like that state of shock. Yeah. Yes the, and no. The other the, yeah. the 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 scenes I'm more talking about are like when Charlie um, sees a woman waving at her from across the road. Or you know, yeah. What's that about? Uh, yeah. Or the or the you know the light flickering things, the reflections that are sort of in, moving independently of the subject. Yeah. It's things like that that are um, deeply unsettling and troubling. I think, and also that there's a very um, interesting trend throughout the film to make everything look like a miniature. Mm. And it's I think because Annie is a miniaturist. Yes. And she she makes like dolls houses and stuff, right? Yeah, but specifically of her own life. And, yeah, you know. So she she makes one of the accident scene where her mm. daughter died. Yeah. But then there's the one that always like I keep coming back to is like in various parts of the film early on she's like, oh, my mother used to insist on feeding Charlie, mm. um, and you think that means with a bottle. Yeah. But no, the miniature reveals like her breastfeeding her child. And her mum getting her boob out next to the bed like, like she wants to Allow me. Yeah. Yeah. Which, the way the film plays out, gives you some sort of context for that later, I would say. Um, yeah. It's, I, I think throughout there's a sort of aim to make things look like miniatures and mm. make, thing, make scenes appear as though you're watching them like they're in a doll's house. Right. I guess that goes back to the... the what I said before about it being a slow cinema thing. Mm. Like it's, it's a, ta- a tableau most of the time. It's very, it's very considered yeah. in that manner, yeah. I, I think also it's, I'm sure there's some sort of thematic element to that in that, you know, they are a small part of a bigger picture mm. or they are like, uh, you know, being toyed with. Yes. Um, those sorts of things, I'm sure, are part of it. Yeah. Mm. Is it the scariest film you've ever seen? Um, I I don't know. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't stay with me. Mm. In but then I don't think many films do now. Now we. I think if I'd yeah. watched it when I was younger, if I watched it when I was thirteen or something. Oh yeah, it would you'd, have. You'd be fucked, fucked me up. You'd be yeah. like institutionalized. Yeah, yeah. Is I think for me it is maybe the scariest film I've seen because okay. like I mean. You and I have a similar mileage for horror, I think. Mm-hmm. And we saw it with another friend of ours who we also saw The Witch and It Comes at Night with. Yeah, we've got a sort of annual, like, miserable film yeah. tradition. <laughs> the A24, just the, like, depressing movie of the year. Um, but we, yeah. we, we, the three of us saw all three films together. Mm-hmm. 
And in all three films, I remember looking around me a few times to see all three of us, uh, out of body experience, I suppose, for hmm. me. Uh, but <laughs> we were all ca- covering our faces to yeah. like, shield it from the horror. And I don't recall ever seeing a film where like it's had that effect on that many people. Because it's not just that like, everyone in the cinema is doing it as well. Yeah. Maybe Green Room as well. I saw mm. that a lot. People would audibly gasping in that but that's for yeah. different reasons it is for, yeah and I think the difference is the difference between this and a sort of you know maybe a, a more traditional horror is that it's the story and, and the the implications of events that are the scary part yeah. of this film whereas I might have seen films that made me sort of more stressed in moments because they are like jump jump scary or yeah. you know things like that more hysterical in that nature but i think this was sort of very measured and very like controlled in the way that it was mm. making you feel there's, there's a human horror to it isn't it mm. like it's not like you're being say you know we've covered a lot of movies where it ends up being a, a big baddie at the end who comes out the shadows and you have to fight them right mm-hmm. how many times did that happen that's not scary compared with oh, you've accidentally killed your sister. Yeah, yeah. And now you have to live with that. That's, mm. that's your life now. Yeah. It's fucked up. What, so when I first saw the trailer, mm-hmm. I assumed it was going to be a kind of babadooky thing in the sense of like, it will be about how grief affects our mental health and how we can inadvertently pass on those kinds of issues to our children. In that bojack horseman kind of way of hmm. uh we inherit our parents trauma but never really understand it sure says the tweet hmm. um and it is that for about 20 minutes and then the high speed decapitation happens hmm. and then it kind of doubles down on that right and it hmm. becomes like and it, how, how does the loss of a parent take the multiplying factor of the loss of a child hmm. how do then how are you then a parent like how does how does that change your behavior as a parent yeah but then you realise that you're being haunted, so it becomes a matter of mental breakdown through the most intense physical test you can imagine. Hmm. So imagine your world is breaking apart, and reality, as you understand it, begins to fall apart because of your grief. And then the actual world starts breaking down, and reality really does start falling apart. Hmm. Like it's, that's why it's so horrifying. It's because it's just like, like your your emotional world is like damaged and then your physical world is damaged in the same way. Yeah. It's really interesting. Though. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think probably similarly to you, I had my assumptions going into the film and they were basically that it was going to be your sort of standard creepy child film, like the exorcist yeah. to which it's very frequently been compared. Yeah. Um, that, uh, notion obviously gets smashed against the telephone pole <laughs> yeah. at 100 miles an hour. Yeah. That is the um, thing. Like when, when the supposed antagonist of the film is dead in 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the reason I think that's so impactful, because it's one of those twists as well where it's like, you spend five minutes after it's happened going, well, not really though. Mm. Like this hasn't actually happened. Yeah. This is, this is a... Because because of the, how the film's set up, you think... He's going to go home and find her in bed. Yeah, yeah. Or something along those lines. Yeah. And then you have, like, the grieving scenes and things like that. And it's and this is for real. Yeah. 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 Uh, but the... Um, I, I found that, like, very surprising. And so surprising that for probably the next hour of the film, I felt completely, like, off balance. Yeah. Watching the film, like I had no idea what was coming next. What was coming yeah. next, and and I felt really unsettled, which is a very good thing, obviously, for a horror film to mm. make you feel. Mm. Um, I think what you mentioned about the passing on about uh, mental illness mm. and inheriting mental illness, I think that is still in there. Yeah, I think, no doubt. No I doubt. think the cult stuff could be read as an allegory for that, mm-hmm. and you know, all of all, yeah. I mean, it's not entirely ambiguous no um but you could interpret it that way yeah let's say that the cult it represents mental illness it Mm. might be that you you as a parent fear that the cult the mental illness is going to affect your children 
as yeah, it affected exactly. the parents, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think, you know, to, you could perhaps draw a, draw a sort of link between mental illness and losing your head, mm. possibly. You yeah, know, maybe I mean, that's there's, a stretch. There's, there's lots of things that come up a lot, like mm. decapitations, uh, the the bowing position comes up a lot. She, when she's grieving, she's in that position. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, and the cult stuff is throughout the film as well. Like the emblem that the cult seem to have shows up all the way through. Yeah, in weird places. On the telephone pole. Yeah. That, um, Fuck, because you see it on the way there, but oh, yeah. gosh. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. <sighs> it's pretty grim. It's pretty grim. Uh, but yeah, it's, I think I think it does have that thematic richness mm. that we like so much. Absolutely. So it, you know, it's compared, as you mentioned, to The Exorcist. Mm-hmm. The, all the all the posters say The Exorcist for a new generation. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've seen Mark Kermode's video about that. He he's a, you know, Mark Kermode, the BBC film critic. Yeah, is a very famous advocate for The Exorcist. Yeah, it's his favourite favorite film. film. Yeah. yeah, and he's he, Mr. Exorcist. Yes, he's re, he's got a video where he just says the problem with comparing anything to The Exorcist is it, it's immediately not as good as The Exorcist no matter what it is and he said often that's misattributed as well because The Exorcist is a very specific thing about crises of faith and you know what it means to be a child and all these sorts of things and he says yeah. often something's compared to The Exorcist which isn't I think, I think he went into Alien and it was like oh it's The Exorcist in space yeah. he's like well there's nothing like The Exorcist yeah. so it's it's misplaced. I think to an extent this is misplaced, right? Because mm-hmm. the only things that's really got in common with The Exorcist are like a window jumping scene mm. uh, and maybe to an extent the possession scene. Well, I think, I think it's the possession elements, it's, it's the satanic elements, mm. it is the creepy child. Yeah. Um, it's, it's certainly not like a, a remake of The Exorcist. No, not at like all, that. not at all. But I think, yeah. It's it's obviously influenced by it in a similar way in a way that all horror movies have to be influenced by The Exorcist because mm. they exist after it. But I felt that that even like the possession scene was kind of more like Poltergeist than The Exorcist. Mm. Uh, you know, but other other movies that influenced it. You got Rosemary's Baby, mm-hmm. which very yeah, yeah very. I clearly. mean, you get the fear that your you and your child are being groomed by a Satan worshipping cult. And yeah. That's that exactly put, that put on a very friendly face as well. Yes, exactly. Uh, Clarice Lowry, in her review, said that a lot of slow scenes uh, feel like they're from It Follows, mm. which is the first time I've heard It Follows described as being so influential, which is good to see. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you, you'll compare the final scene to Kill List, mm. but it felt a lot more like The Witch to me. I think, yeah, they, they um, are very... Almost like a remake. Like It's close up on the character's face with the the plot being revealed to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I th- I think there are elements. Yeah. Th- there's a there's a crowning element. Yes. That is that is shared. Yeah. Um as is the fact that the central participant is like unwilling or unwittingly yeah. been just been drawn into it. Yeah. I th- I think going back a bit further, um there's a I, I'm not sure whether you've seen it, but um there's a strong link between this and Don't Look Now, mm-hmm. um, which I think we should do quite soon okay. on the podcast. But it's, it's that's a very um, that is a, a a drama that has tinges of horror in okay. the same way that this does, and it is also about sort of profound grief. Okay. Um, and so yeah, there, there, there's there's definitely an element of Don't Look Now in there. Um, I think the Wicker Man as well, like just the oh, sort yeah, of culty yeah. angle yeah. of that. Um, but yeah, it comes at night as well. I think yeah. the well, A twenty four must have a checklist for movies now. Yeah, for like how to how to make you feel like you're going to shoot yourself. The yeah, whole film. exactly. Or or not not so much make you shoot yourself, but just sort of make you so upset and uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. that you yeah. like you're rooted to your seat yeah. afterwards. Because what what a run they've got! Green Room, mm-hmm. The Witch. It comes at night, and now hereditary. Yeah, I think it follows with A twenty four as well. Yeah, possibly yeah. it was. Yeah, they um, they are they're they're a very interesting um, production yeah, company. Yeah. yeah, the uh, earlier in the film, I mean, throughout the film, actually, hmm. I think that the nightmare scenes are, you could say, drawn from either The Shining in how matter of fact and just like that's that's how you got to hmm. deal with it, like the. 
the maze in the yeah, shining exactly or like the you know when they're walking around and they see like dead children over here yeah and then yeah. they're gone they're so like, well mm. that's that walks it when he walks into the ballroom or yeah. whatever yeah. yeah that's just that's fine yeah um or i guess nightmare on elm street you got like the the school scenes in that mm. were very much you know they felt like that walking down the corridors with no one's there yeah it feels like you're talking about the remake yeah the nightmare on elm street remake yeah. 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 Why, why, why it's would good I talk see about that, it's good to see that it's been influential. <laughs> why would I talk about Wes Craven when you've got Rob Zombie? No, I don't even know. Not even Rob Zombie. Can't remember. Just some guy. Yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's a movie which plays out like a greatest hits, which we often say isn't necessarily a good thing in things mm-hmm. like Insidious, but it takes those elements from these other films and it doesn't like usually we'd say oh but it doesn't do them as well i think yeah. it does them in some ways better i think it stands up against the the greats of yeah. the genre and i think it will be a film that's i like i don't think it comes at night will be remembered as a great in the pantheon of horror i think we really enjoyed it yeah and it had an effect on exactly, us yeah the but, same way like um you were never really here right that was a yeah. good film but it, no one's gonna give a fuck about right. it in two years time yeah but I think this will be a sort of a watermark for horror. Hope so. Hmm. Next week, Jurassic World 2. Hmm. So, Chris, this movie features someone going through a window. <laughs> yeah. A defenestration. Yeah. What do you really know about <laughs> defenestrations in movies? Yeah. <laughs> As we play my defenestration in movies quiz. Question one. Oh, okay, sorry. There are questions about people going through windows. Yeah, I got, I did, <laughs> yeah. I got that. Uh, not multiple choice. You just tell me the answer if you know it. Okay. Which you should do. I don't know if you've seen all these films. I think you will have seen all of them except maybe question one. In the Hudsucker Proxy. Mm-hmm. Seen it? Uh, yeah. By your heroes. Current brothers. brothers, yeah. When his plan fails... Paul Newman's character attempts to die by suicide by throwing himself out the window, mimicking the actions of the character earlier in the film. Mm-hmm. What stops him? Is it like reinforced glass? Sexy glass, yeah. 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 Correct? Thanks. Well done. Have you seen it? Yeah, okay. It's good. Like years ago, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not one of their best ones. It's, quite it's almost like a weird sort of Disney yeah. film, isn't it? But then also really dark. Yeah, but like family... Family friendly, kind yeah. Of like it's, like it's fr- not, it's not got their sort of violent streak that they almost always have in it. Yeah, it's a bit, yeah, a bit more. You could show you. Like, like I did watch a, it online. Is it a PG? Yeah. It's, it's light. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's good because it's like it has the, the feel of a Coen Brothers movie where everything just happens by accident. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about that quote that you said recently about Pixar. How yeah. they, uh, coincidences are fine. For people to get into trouble, but yeah. not to get out of trouble yeah. when they're talking about writing stories. It's like the Coens just don't give a shit about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're just like everything's a coincidence, yeah. nothing planned. Fuck it. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Anyway, question two. Yeah. In the Bourne Identity, mm-hmm. Jason Bourne is attacked by an assassin in a Parisian apartment. The fight ends with a defenestration. But what is significant about it? Uh, the assassin does it to himself. <laughs> yeah. Why? Is it assuming he's going to get a savage beating? So uh, I think he's um, had his, like, maybe his arm broken or right. something like that. Basically, he's going to lose the fight. Yeah. And he's, uh, um, I think he's been stabbed a few times as well with a pen. So he knows the game's up. Yeah, I think so. So he'd rather take his chances with a... Because he doesn't, I think, he doesn't I think dive through the window. He just he just runs into the. Like, I think sirens are approaching, maybe as well. Right. Is it is um, odd? It's clumsy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that before or after he rides a body down a stairwell? Uh, he doesn't ride it down the stairwell. He he lands on it like a wet mattress. <laughs> what a man! Yeah. In Watchmen. Yeah. Question, question three. In Watchmen, what song is playing? When the comedian is thrown through his apartment window in the dead of night. Oh, um, is it the Bob Dylan? No, I think that's the opening. Of the that's film. right. That's like the times they're changing. Yeah, because they're literally changing because they've rewritten history. Yeah, I, I don't know. I thought it was Sound of Silence. No, that's his funeral, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's unforgettable by Nat King Cole. 
Okay. I never would have got that. That's, well. <laughs> That's why, darling, it's incredible that someone so unforgettable thinks that I am unforgettable too. Failure. That's failure for you. In question four, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> the film ends with the chief escaping the clinic by throwing what through a window? Um, is it a sink or something? Or like a toilet? I'll give it. It was a water fountain. Oh, okay, yeah. You, yeah. you, you knew it was, it was a plumbing, plumbing, plumbing related. Yeah. 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 Um, there you go. Question five. Final question. Mm-hmm. In The Exorcist, what is Father Merrin's last line before throwing himself through the window? Um. Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> is that your answer? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I can't remember. Wrong. It wasn't Father Merrin, it was Father Karras. Oh, all right. Question six. What was what his? Is, what, was his <laughs> what is Father Karras' last line before throwing himself oh, through the window? Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> it was... Take me, come into me, God damn you, take me, take me, no! <laughs> so, so memorable. <laughs> <laughs> Rolls off its son. I think Kermode has a tattoo of it. <laughs> it's navel. So there you have it. Um, what is that, two out of three? Two out of five? Something like that, two or three. Yeah. Well, well that, was fine. that was good. We discovered things that I know. But what do we know, Joe, yeah. about King Payman? Nothing is the answer to that. Well, he's one of the eight kings of hell? Yeah, well, he's one of Lucifer's most obedient devotees. Okay. Uh, he rules 200 legions of angels. and is, Or it might be a legion of 200 angels. I right. might have written it down wrong. And it, uh, he's connected to the Tree of Death. Uh, he's often depicted as having a woman's face or feminine features riding a camel. Wh- according to who? Uh, this is according to da, 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 a number of sources, including Alistair Crowley's The Gotia, uh, The Lesser Key of Solomon, The Book of Arab- Abramelin. Uh, tend to crop up in uh, Christian grimoires, okay. which I think are like sort of writings around you know, satanic things yeah. from Christian era. Uh, King Payman is the ninth spirit listed in Alistair Crowley's The Gotcha, The Lesky of Solomon. Payman, how, how does Alistair Crowley know all this? He's into all that shit, isn't he, mate? Is he? wrong Absolute wrong Payman Payman can teach all arts and sciences and other secret things. He can discover unto thee what the earth is and what hold and what holdeth it up in the waters, and what mind is, and where it is, or any other thing thou mayest desire to know. He giveth dignity, and confirmeth the same. He bindeth or maketh any man subject unto the magician, if he so desire it. He giveth good familiars, and as such can teach all arts. Thing is, mate, all those sound like fine things for me. Yeah. 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 Why wouldn't you want that? Uh, well, a familiar is like a cat or something, right? A familiar is like, I thought it would be like a, a it's basically like he's um, good at like sculptures and uh, no, paintings. A familiar is like... Um, a friend or something. Like or Sa- like, Salem in Sabrina the Teenage Witch is her familiar. Right, I see. Well, he giveth good familiars, so that's good. Um, it essentially seems like King Payman's all-knowing, you know. What's the omniscient. downsides of him? Uh... Those are the pros. What are the cons? Well, the thing is, right, demons are only demons to those they demonize. Yeah. And that would be Christians who don't like science or art right. in the Middle Ages. So that's why he's, he's said to be demonic right. when, he, when he's practicing all these things. So right? Crowley's all like, oh, let's just do some paintings and <laughs> demonstrate the scientific method with our planning. Well, his other powers, right, in, in the book of Abramelin, which again is a Christian grimoire, Uh, Payman's powers include knowledge of past and future events, clearing up doubts. (laughs) (laughs) In what way? Just clearing them up. Like if you've, if you're like, I'm not sure about about this. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me tell you. 
um, making spirits appear, creating visions, acquiring and dismissing servant spirits. So you can get rid of them as well as <laughs> acquire them. Right. Uh, he's good at hiring and firing. But yeah, yeah, yeah. He's good HR. Uh, reanimating the dead for several years. Flight, remaining underwater indefinitely. <laughs> Well, so is and that why, why you were a witch if you do that? Possibly. And general abilities to make all kinds of things and all sorts of people and armour appear at the behest of the magician. It's in, in some ways infuriatingly vague and in yeah. other ways suspiciously specific. Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's oh, like we'll clear up we... doubts and we'll give you armor yeah well, like, it's, well it's like it's like oh he can he knows all he can see past and future he can stay underwater indefinitely <laughs> <laughs> it is it is oddly specific yeah. but now that we know about him <laughs> jay yeah how we know how best to survive him yeah but that you know that's one thing how would you survive Game. if you were in hereditary well, how I would survive, for starters, Joe, is a little bit of basic fire safety. Okay. If you're going to light something on fire in your home, a yeah. big object, for example, a person, yeah. then I would have a fire extinguisher close to hand. Right. Now, she, know, she, is, she, is, she knoweth. She knoweth the um, series of events in that when she burneth the book... Yeah. Uh, Fireth, <laughs> um, fireth may come. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So she thinks that she's going to set on fire. Mm. Um, what I don't understand is why she doesn't go. Listen, Stephen. I need to burn this book, but I have a strong suspicion that when I do, I'm going to set on fire as well. Yeah. Could you hold this fire extinguisher, mm. and then when I Ignite, mm. please extinguish the fire for me, please. Right. Yeah, two, two, two points I'd make to that. Mm -hmm. Number one, we, you know, it's a magic fire, isn't it? Yeah. It, well, the, the fire extinguisher I mean, put out magic fire. Well, the fire does go out. It's not everlasting, isn't it? Well, it, it presumably it burns as long as the book does, which is enough to kill someone, but not enough to like immolate their entire body. Like there's not just ash left. There is, no, there no, is a body exactly. there. Yeah, but that, that makes me think that th the fire would eventually go out. Well, if you would... Like, uh, yeah, how, what are the right. limits of supernatural <coughs> fire? Like, we don't really know that, do no, we? No, we don't. Like, if, if she was set on fire and then jumped in a swimming pool, would the fire carry on? I think so. Right. I think it's not burning due to a fuel on her. It's yeah. burning due to a fuel King Payment has come up with. Right. King Payman is presumably there. Well, he knows all arts and sciences. So, yeah. so he, he's just pouring paint thinner from beyond the... Exactly, yeah. Whatever he's, wherever he is yeah. on that. That's point one. Point two, mm. would you say she is thinking rationally at that point? Uh, no, but then Stephen should really it's like offer it as a solution. But do you think... Well, he, he, does, he thinks it's hokey. Right, the whole thing. okay, yeah. But Correctly. Right, that that is well. He's not correct though, is he? He's he, yeah, but like <laughs> uh, based on everything, right? Like he, in, he, he, he is rationally. correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Like earlier on, he was writing an email saying, "Like I think my like, wife's losing her mind hmm. because she is." Yeah. With good reason, but still. Yeah, but yeah, it's true. Well, she's acting rationally in an irrational situation. Yeah. So you're saying that she she never did anything wrong, is what you're saying. Because, uh, you know, that it could be argued. Yeah, I, I guess... So. Well, I don't know. Like, yeah, it depends on your interpretation of the film, basically. Mm. But, like, having a fire extinguisher to hand... Like, we don't know whether or not the supernatural fire could have been put yeah. out by a fire extinguisher. It could have been that the fire extinguisher runs out and the fire starts up again. We don't know. But also, it seems burning the book was pretty ineffective anyway. Yeah, that is true. Because it didn't stop her soaring off her own head with the piano. Right? Yeah, when well, she gets possessed like two seconds after Stephen is burned to death. Yeah. So uh, that is a fair point. <laughs> so summarise that one. Uh, if you're going to, if someone's going to get set on fire in your house, get a fire extinguisher. Fair enough. Can't argue with it. No. Only um, it's a little bit hypothetical for my liking. Yeah. Say. Okay. Um, my, my point is for the whole Graham family, 
but I guess Charlie specifically because mm. it affects her most. Carry your EpiPen with you mm-hmm. because you will die of anaphylactic shock if you don't have it and you have nuts by accident. Yeah, they. I think they're quite expensive in America, but they are clearly a well-off family. Aren't and they? they have an EpiPen. They mentioned yeah, they, say, they say, yeah. oh, we didn't bring it. Yeah. Bring it yeah. is the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, NHS advice is mm. carry the auto-injector at all times or encourage your child to do so if they're old enough. I think she's old enough. Yeah. You may be prescribed two injectors. Check with your GP or the doctor in charge of your care. You may also be given an emergency card or bracelet with full details of your child's allergy and the contact details of their doctor to alert others. This should be worn at all times. Mm. Uh, don't see her wearing one of those. Don't see her carrying the EpiPen. She dies because of it. That's yeah. what I'd say. Yeah, can't really argue with that. No. Um, it would have saved her life. Um, and that's why that's why you should really carry an EpiPen. If yeah. anyone's listening to this and you've got an allergy, the reason you should carry an EpiPen is in case your brother accidentally smashes your head against a telephone pole. At 100 miles an hour. At 100 miles an hour, yeah. Well, a uh, similar, similar point in the film that I'd like to um, mm. make, you know, contest. Uh, get a car that has child locks or... Um, child safe windows yep. as I think every car in the world in Europe has <laughs> yeah. maybe it's an American thing because they're the land yeah. of the free yeah uh, sovereign citizens yeah exactly it's, it's good you know well done that's that's worked out well for you um, I mean wear a seatbelt she's obviously in some distress so that's yeah. going to be difficult but the, the window she wouldn't have been able to get down far enough for yeah. her to stick her head no, out absolutely, yeah. um, and whole head yeah, a bit of her head. Yeah. She might have, like, you know, made... She might like, have scalped her. Yeah, or, like, her <laughs> nose off. Yeah. Uh, but you can you can survive that <laughs> at 100 miles an hour. Um, it would have saved everyone a lot of bother, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. Hmm. It would have done that, correct. Yeah. So, do you want to know my next one? Yeah. Call an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, in, in the event of decapitation? No, in the event of oh, allergic no. reaction. Anaphylactic yeah. shock. He, he, probably doesn't wanna, he probably doesn't want to like become a social outcast by calling an ambulance. What's to, more important? Yeah. It, it, do you I'd think, say do you think the he film? becomes a social outcast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, that is fair. Yeah, make, I mean, he is a social outcast. Yeah. And he's not exactly like Mr. Mr. Cool at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. He's very much not that at the end, is he? <laughs> Why does no one like, mention the event at school? Like, oh, aren't well, you? They the might guy? do. They just don't show it in the movie. Aren't you the like, guy who decapitated also, his sister? Yeah, that is a bit of an uncomfortable thing to bring up, isn't it? Well, do you remember when you were high and driving your car at hundred miles an hour and smashed your sister's head clean off her body? Ugh. Bit of a downer, isn't it? Ambulance, need that. ambulance would arrive in you know, quicker than you could drive there. And they'd have the EpiPen. So maybe, yeah. Don't know what American healthcare is like in that part of the world. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, final um, tip on how to survive. Yeah. It's just to, you know, everything's, it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Really. Right. Which go- ties into what you were saying earlier about King Payment. Okay. You know, learning all about arts and sciences uh, sounds good. Useful. Sounds appealing, right? Yeah, beneficial. You know, le- learning about science in the world can be fascinating and enlightening. Yeah. Um, so maybe give some thought to joining the cult. Yeah. Uh, Breathing underwater of, indefinitely. Yeah, you don't see any of the followers die. It's only the Graham family. Well, the, no, Ellen dies in the beginning. She's dead. Yeah, she the dies starts. of old age. She and had a good innings. She had a better innings than Charlie. Well, mental decay did set in. Yeah, but that, that's no... That's Absolutely the best of us. Yeah, exactly. That's not necessarily anything to do with the cult. It's just dementia, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose so. It might have had too much knowledge. <laughs> um, and it looks like it can lead to riches as well, by the looks of things. Apparently, yeah. So um, maybe sign up. Yep. King Payman. Yeah. Come to our Patreon and we will... <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a Patreon. Maybe no. we should. Yeah, I or think it would be embarrassing, though, wouldn't it? It would be terribly embarrassing. <laughs> or never everyone's like, oh, he's like... You're five patrons. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're really good ones, though. Maybe maybe they'll be King Payman right. advocates, and they'll be like, yeah, we want you to have all our money. Okay, but you have to call it how to join King Payman's 
followers. Yep. So there you go. That's it for that, mm. isn't it? Did you enjoy it? Yes, I did, yeah. Good chat. Yeah. Good chatting with you. Yeah. Nice wonderful. to see you. Always is. Yeah, and, I, and just a quick note that um, a lot of people emailed and tweeted and things saying, are we going to do Hereditary? Mm. And we were always planning on doing it because we had, had seen trailers and things. Yes. Uh, which is why if you emailed saying, oh, you should do Hereditary, we haven't given you a shout out uh, per se. No. Uh, because... Um, why the fuck would we? Why would you? Why would we give you credit for our ideas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, do get in touch uh, if you would like to. How to survive show at gmail dot com at how to survive pod. Yeah, those are the methods with which to get in touch. Yeah, like these people have done. Olivia has been in touch. Mm-hmm. Hi, I really love the podcast, and n- oh, thank you. And now have been led to search out a good film for suggestion. So I'm recommending, in the broadest sense of the word, you cover House of a Thousand Corpses. Okay. Survival, survival ideas, get out faster, and don't pick up random hitchhikers. Olivia. Um, Sounds like a hitchhiker movie. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything about that movie, no. but that does sound like reasonable advice for life in general. Mm. Get out faster and don't pick up random hitchhikers. Yeah. We'll add it to our list of considerations. Mm-hmm. We may get to it in the next couple of months, so look out for House of One Thousand Corpses. Mm. Next email comes from Kieran, regular correspondent. You'll remember Kieran recommended Hellraiser and Children of the Corn. Yeah. I did We've try the Brocker's email, <laughs> but he managed to get through. Hello, fellas. Just a quick question. Will you be covering Hereditary? You just, you just ruled out talking to him. And yeah. he, he snuck through anyway. Kieran, stop it. God, you sound posh. Do it. Kieran, stop it. I'm, I, I'm I, posh. Me. <laughs> oh, my dear boy. <laughs> Final email this week comes from Tim. Hi, guys. I'd love to hear your perspective on Sinister from 2012. Not only because this film scared the shit out of me. Mm. Uh, Tim did put an asterisk in shit, so I wouldn't have to swear. But did anyway. S word out of me. Mm. But also because I have no idea if it is even possible for the main character to survive the plot after moving into the house. Mm. Hopefully you guys do know how to survive to calm me down. Kind thanks, Tim. And kind thanks to you, Tim, for emailing in. Mm. Have you seen Sinister? Did we yeah, see it we together? Yeah, we saw it together. At Years cinema. ago. Yeah. Which one is it? It's the uh, Ethan Hawke-led... Uh, he's a writer mm. about, like, true crime or, like, murder houses. Yeah. And he, he's Buys writing one. a book yeah. and he moves his family into a <laughs> murder house. And it doesn't, doesn't end up... What a legend. Well. Yeah. Yeah, what this like, <laughs> crime writer did to write the crime will shock you. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Thank you very much yeah. for emailing in. Uh, that's how to survive show at gmail dot com. Twitter handle is at how to survive pod. Don't forget to leave a review on iTunes, as it really helps us to find a wider audience. Which is, of course, the only reason we do it. We don't yeah. just want to be talking to you guys all the time. Yeah. Listen, Tim, Kieran, and Olivia. We like you and everything, but you're not you're not enough for us hmm. anymore. We need more. Yeah. More! And more will be coming next week in the form of episode 149, Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom. We did Jurassic World, episode four, yep. all those years ago. Yes. And now it's time for the sequel. I can't wait to talk about it. Joe is itching to tell you how he feels, but you're going to have to wait until next week. So thank you very much for listening. See you then. And until then, let's rub it. You do it then. No, too high. Uh, That's the one.